up, everyone? Welcome to Cultivate and Keep. This is Jeremy. And this is Corey. My good, good friend, Corey. What's up, dude? Lifelong friends for like 12 years, it is? So I think four. 10. Man, 10. All right. Almost. It's cool. You don't know how long you've been friends. <laughs> no big deal. Anyway, guys, welcome to Cultivate and Keep. <laughs> We're excited that you're listening today. Um, today, uh, Corey's going to be leading the topic, and uh, I think we're good, though. No announcements, and we'll probably just go right into it. Let's roll. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, so I thought it'd be interesting just to talk about um, being honest with God and sort of being more transparent and authentic, and I'm curious about your thoughts based on the conversation that we had from the last episode a little bit, kind of digging into it, um, but just what it means to to be real with God and to just kind of... I don't know, up your communication with God, like not try to put up a face or a front with God. Anyways, um, so where this kind of started was I stumbled upon um, this story. And actually, I, I did a message on this at a Foothills Christian High School chapel. Um, and so I felt like the Lord kind of gave me that for them. But it also started with um, reading this chapter in Mark. So I'll just read a couple of verses here. But it's Mark 9, uh, chapter, or verses 14 through 27. This is when Jesus was um, kind of in the middle of his ministry and he was going town to town ministering to people. Like at at this time he set up sort of like a big deal. Like people are talking from cities to cities, like they're going to see him, they're bringing people to him. And so like he's a, he's a, he's in high demand essentially. So it says verse 14, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around him and teachers of the law arguing with him. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. And so uh, then it talks about Jesus. He says, what are you arguing, arguing with them about? And a man in the crowd answered, Jesus, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into an, into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And he said, from childhood, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. Okay, so it's a pretty gnarly story, right? Um, In fact, this is probably one of the gnarlier stories that you see um, in Jesus' story, um, you know, relating to demons and oppression and um, but I think it's fascinating. Like if you can just kind of picture like this guy's life with his son, he's only a boy, right? But say it's like his entire life. He's been oppressed by this demon who has, um, basically just taken complete control of him. He'll just throw him to the ground. He'll convulse or seize. Um, he can't control himself. It'll throw him into the fire or water to try to kill him. Like imagine being that boy's father and how helpless yeah. and how like desperate you must be. Um, I mean, it's probably hard enough, like parenting a boy. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a demonic boy. Right. <laughs> it's like Sometimes they might seem possessing when they're not, yeah. but then you have someone who's really actually oppressed by a demon mm-hmm. and the conversation and the kind of the dialogue that they have is super interesting because, um, because the father brings his son to Jesus and then, uh, and then he says, how long has he been like this? And he tells him from childhood and then he says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Like, it's kind of like a, well, you know, if you can do it, like I can just imagine his voice just kind of being like, like very like timid and kind of like, like just um like not so sure of himself and not so confident. And Jesus is almost like insulted. You know what I mean? He's like appalled. He's like, if you can, like mm-hmm. who, like who do you think that I am? Like, who do you think that you're talking to? And he says, everything is possible for one who believes. And then he says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And that one was the real kicker for me because if you, if you read it enough times and you look at it, it doesn't make any sense, right? How could you believe, but also have unbelief, right? It kind of seems like it doesn't make sense. Like it's an oxymoron. Um, But what what he's alluding to is, uh, is that he's, 
he's struggling, right? He, he does believe, but also he has doubts. Also, he has struggles. Also, he's not too sure, right? And, and if you look at his situation with his son, he's been like this for a long time. And I'm sure that he's tried so many different kind of solutions in the past and different remedies and seen people and, and, um, and just really tried uh, everything, everything that he could. So he's trying not to even get his hopes up maybe that much. Um, but the thing I want to touch on was that he was honest and he says, help me overcome my unbelief, right? He, he basically just admits to Jesus in his face mm-hmm. when Jesus, when he's asking Jesus to perform a miracle on his son, like, I'm, I gotta be honest. I, I have some doubts. Like I, I have some struggles. Um, so yeah, just the, just this idea of like being real with God on the kind of putting it on the table and not like putting up a face. Um, but what are your, some of the thoughts, some of your first thoughts, just reading it and kind of going through it? Yeah. Um, well, it reminds me of, I was thinking about <clears throat> when I first started doing sales, um, it was probably like six or seven years ago. And I remember, um, it was probably like the quarter number three. And so with sales, like typically every quarter, like your numbers, um, restart and you have, um, at least for me, I had a quote I had to meet. And so, yeah. um, it was like this benchmark goal I had to hit. Right. And if I didn't hit it, like it sucked and. It was like a big deal, so I always wanted to get that number. And I remember my first two quarters, I uh, didn't keep track of it. Like I didn't like really, you know, keep track of my leads. I didn't keep track of where I was at and uh, getting my goal. I just kind of like went with it. And the first two quarters, like I did, I did fine. But the third quarter, I remember, um, I was like halfway through, and I was like really struggling. But I wasn't like daily watching that chart and watching where I was at. And halfway through, I kind of like was hit with this realization, like how do I know like if I'm succeeding, if I don't like measure myself, you have to like know Mm. where you're at in order to like to beat something or to accomplish a goal. And it was like an eye opening moment for me. Like from that point forward, like I almost always hit my quota because I knew like where every day I was seeing, like, where am I at? Like, you know, if if I was low, like I knew what I had to do in order to meet that quota. Right. And uh, I don't know as you're like reading that story and kind of at the end, you were talking about like just really being like, being real like where where do you stand with god like whether it's Mm. unbelief or maybe it's uh, like with the sin or uh, whatever whatever it is like where do you stand Uh, like if you're not honest with yourself if you're not measuring that if you're not like really checking that uh like this this, it doesn't matter like if you the truth is you either have belief or you don't have belief either you're going to make the sales goal you're not going to make the sales goal but um i think we get caught in this like almost I don't know, we, we deceive ourselves but i think it's almost like we're afraid to know where we're, where we're really at yeah like we're, we're like afraid to know like the real truth of of something and so we just don't check it hmm. and we kind of just like hope we're on track yeah and anyway as we were talking that's kind of what came to my mind and go ahead i was gonna say <laughs> like, that reminds me of, of a story that um or analogy that your dad used at our marriage class that we're going through um and he talks about how like sometimes when you're sick or something hurts or, uh, I don't know, like something seems wrong. Like we put off going to the doctor because like, maybe we're afraid of like knowing or hearing from him, like the thing that we're afraid of, even though maybe we feel like, Oh, I have the flu or yeah, like my foot is broken or like I have a massive headache. Like maybe like something is wrong. It's still like, we don't want to face the reality of it. So we try to procrastinate and just kind of ignore it. Um, but ignoring it doesn't fix it. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of like, it's still there. Like, right. And that's one of the things I want to touch on too is how um, ignoring it doesn't solve any problems. And ignoring kind of where you're at with God, it also like, it's not like things stand still. Things actually get worse and you draw further away from God and and your faith dies over time if you don't invest in it too. Um, But I also want to start with, uh, you know, just kind of like the idea of is it okay to have doubts and struggles in your faith? Like, is it, is it okay to have questions that you have or, or even things that you're not sure about? Um, Hebrews eleven six says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, but anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. All right. And so like, can you be a Christian and like not have faith sometimes, you know, like, can you be a Christian and, um, and maybe not be a hundred percent sure in your heart that God is real and that, and that you're saved, um, and that you're saved from your sins. Like basically, is it okay to allow yourself to be vulnerable and kind of take a reality check of where your heart's at? I, um, just last night I was talking about that with my, my high school boys 
And like my answer to that from, from my perspective is like, yes, like it's, it's okay to yeah. definitely have those thoughts and, and those doubts. Um, I think like it's so much better to like have those thoughts and to detect them and to like realize they exist um, rather than kind of go, go about like not really checking them, not really thinking about them. Um, the, the problem lies when you don't like do anything with it and you don't explore those thoughts. Um, so I think like in the right context and with the right, you know, mentors or leaders or like friends, like it's really good actually to explore those and to yeah. talk them out and to like, you know, do some digging, like go do some reading and, you know, pray and, you know, do some research. Like don't just let it sit. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's my take on it. Like, yeah, it's definitely good, but, but figure it out. Don't just let it sit. Um, and also like, don't just like Google it, <laughs> like go talk yeah. to someone that you respect and that, you know, um, has knowledge. I was, um, hanging out with a friend on mon- uh, Monday night or Sunday, Sunday night and uh, he's 30 and so he's a little bit older than me but we're just talking and as we were talking like something would come up and um, maybe like hey what are your thoughts on this and he and he I love that he I think he said four times that night he said um, he was like well you should ask someone like wiser than me and who knows more than me but my thoughts are this and, like I love that I think that was so cool for him yeah. because he still like shared his opinion and he had like a voice but he was like pointing me in, like the right direction. No, that was like a good thing. He wasn't to do. pretending that like he yeah, he's knew like, yeah, for it, sure. Yeah, cool. But yeah. I liked that he was acknowledging that. So yeah, and I remember, I remember being in seventh grade and like having grown up in the Christian like home, a Christian church, like very much being kind of in the routine of a Christian lifestyle. But then in seventh grade, just kind of like walking away from all of it and deciding I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I want to have like the high school experience. I don't know if God's real and like, I don't know if any of this is true. So I'm just going to walk away from it. Um, and so like there's two parts of that one before that I had failed to address it. And although I was young too, like I still, I still didn't want to face the fact that like, maybe I'm not actually Christian. Like maybe my faith isn't as strong as I thought. So then when it finally came to a point of like, I'm not sure if this is real, I had nothing to go off of already like these thoughts have just kind of been like festering in my heart for a long time and then afterwards i remember coming to um foothills high school and like you know somehow god got me there and uh but i remember like going through my first uh chapel and that was such a weird experience to me of like well all these people are christians like or at least i thought all of them were uh i was gonna yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're they're raising their hands, they're closing their eyes, they're singing, like the room is dark and it just seemed like so spiritual and I was just thinking like what am I missing? Okay, weird. Like I'm just just going to ignore it. Like okay, fine. I'll just kind of like close my eyes, sing some songs, think some things and like just get through it. And um so that's what I did for the first like the several first uh chapels that I went to. And then, you know, started hanging out with you guys started going to small group and uh, winter camp and that's when the Lord kind of opened my eyes. But I remember for a long time, just like wanting to ignore it and feeling like, well, like maybe God is real, but like, no, nah, I don't want to do anything about it right now. Like, or I'll just wait or I'll do it later. Like I'll do it when I'm a junior or a senior in high school. But like right now I just want to like have fun and like do whatever. Um, but at the same time you can't leave it unaddressed. Like you can't just ignore it. It doesn't fix anything. And it's still, it still festers uh, in your heart. Uh, well, I like your point. You said earlier, um, you said like, if you like leave something untouched and you have like those thoughts of like, eh, like I'll deal with that later. It's kind of like the, um, like the analogy of going to the doctor. It's like whatever you may have like going on in your body. It doesn't or, change anything. Or, like the thing with the sales, like whatever happens, like it's still going to continue. So if you're sick, like your body's going to get worse. Like if you're not hitting your sales numbers, like, you're going to run out of time. Like it's the same thing to where it, until you address it, like the problem still festers. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it's interesting because like, we know that we're not, I guess people, we're not dumb. Like we're aware of that principle, but um, like probably like more people than not, are probably guilty of, of this, of just of having like the, amb- the unbelief or something unsettled and letting it, um, I continue like letting it sit. And I, I don't like know why that is. As you were talking, I was thinking like, okay, like we know what's true, but like, why, why does this happen? Hmm. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. Well, I think it goes back to our last episode talking about like making hard choices and doing hard things. Mm-hmm. We just like facing reality is a very hard That's thing to do. And, um, like being honest with God, addressing your unbelief, also a very difficult thing to do. Like big, existential questions like why am i here 
Um, who is God? Like, what's he like? What does he want to do with me? Those are giant questions and they're not the easiest to just kind of like explore or ask or, um, or even entertain in any way. Well, that's, it's funny you say that. It reminds me, I was thinking, um, like just last week, I can't remember what it was. I would share if I remember, but there was something that like I was supposed to do. Connie wanted me to, I think, I think it was like having a conversation with someone that like was probably like a little uncomfortable. Like I had to confront some, someone about something and Connie was encouraging me to do that. And I was like putting it off and, uh, like I just like didn't do it. Like mm-hmm. I just like no reason why I just <laughs> literally didn't do it. Um, and it wasn't even like that. I like forgot. I just like kind of ignored it. Like, like you're saying, I kind of like forced my mind to pretend like it wasn't there. And I just focused on like my daily task and I didn't do it. Like a week, a week went by and she was like, Hey, like, so have you done this? And I was like, Oh shoot. Like, I'm really sorry. Like, no. And she was like, just so like confused. Like, why would you not do it? And I had like no reason. I mean, I just kind of said, Oh, yeah. I got busy and blah, blah. And her response was like, like, you have to do it. You can't just not do that, you know? And kind of like after talking about it, what, what we like came to conclusion was that like, I said, you know, like I think I just, when there's something I don't want to deal with, I just won't do it. Like, I was, it's so easy just to put it off. And it's not that I'm acknowledging that I have to do it. And I like, don't do it. I just like convinced my mind it's not there. Yeah. And so, um, I think that's like, part of this stuff. Like this idea of whether it's doing hard things or like maybe it's checking our unbelief. Like it's easy for us to just ignore it and like, yeah, pretend it's not there yeah i'm just gonna continue with my work i'm gonna play some more video games i'm gonna watch some more tv i'm gonna go on my phone like there's so many different distractions that it makes it easy to never uh you could never address it and you could never you could go your whole life without having to think Mm -hmm. a hard thought or to confront a hard thing about yourself um i think that that letting your unbelief go and not really like doing anything about it can produce a couple different kinds of Christians that we see. Um, and so I want to go over them really quickly because like, this is a, a reality check for us. Like, do we fit the description for any of these um, sort of not optimal or um, I don't know. In other words, types of Christians that you don't want to be types of Christians that are uh, maybe not even Christians at all, possibly, but I want to go through them because I think it's a good reality check for you. Um, and for me, just to, to look at our hearts and say, where are we at? And one of the first things is if you're not checking your unbelief, if you're not being real with God, that you can turn into a nominal Christian, right? You can just be a Christian just by name. Um, you might call yourself a Christian. You might have uh, a verse in your Instagram bio. You might, um, I don't know, go to church. You might have Christian friends, but just calling yourself a Christian doesn't automatically make you a Christian. Um, first John two, four says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So in other words, it's not just about what you say or call yourself. It's about what you do and how you act and where your heart is. And there's a huge disconnect for some people on like the external self that they present to other people or to God or even to themselves, how they want to think of themselves mm-hmm. and who they actually are inside. Like who like what the essence is of their being. Um, I was looking up some stats and according to a study in 2015, 75% of Americans claim to be Christians, which is like a stupid high number yeah. to me, like considering all the stuff that's going on in the world today. And 62% of people claim to be part of a church. That also seems like who, where, like what kind of churches are they going to if yeah. they are going to church? Now, I think that that one's a little more easy to kind of dispel like someone could say they go to church and go to church once a year on Easter or Christmas. You know what I mean? But, um, but if you're, there's no way that 62% of Americans are like regularly two, three, four times a week going to church. Um, but it just goes to show that there's a lot of nominal Christians out there who can't address the fact that maybe they're not actually a Christian. They just call themselves a Christian. Um, but the reality is like, that doesn't matter. Like you, if you're not a Christian, like the reality is like you are like spending eternity in hell, like apart from God. And, yeah. um, you, you talk about those surveys or people that have the opinion of they're a Christian. I have a coworker that would always say like, come on, Jeremy, like come out and party with us. Like go to the strip clubs and, and TJ with us. And he's like on Sunday, just ask God for forgiveness. <laughs> and he's God. like, that's, that's how it works. Right. And I'm just like, dude, like you have literally no idea. Yeah. And it's like sad. Like 
it was funny because like I wanted to like, laugh at him, but it's like the reality is like he is gonna spend his the, his eternity mm. in hell because like, he. That's hard. It doesn't matter if like you don't know, or it doesn't matter if like you've convinced yourself, oh, I'm a Christian. Like you're this nominal Christian. You just you go by the name of it, and you that's like who you think you are. But it doesn't change reality. It doesn't change like what right. what the, your course of your life is gonna be. Yeah, definitely. One of the other types of Christians that you can turn into is a lukewarm Christian. And I feel like this is the one that I relate to the most, um, especially like in high school when I got saved. This is like the whole kind of premise of how and why I got saved was that feature quest. Bill Wilson gave the message and he talked about this verse, Revelation 3.16. It says, so because you are lukewarm and neither not nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. In other words, a lukewarm Christian is someone who is sort of living a double life. Like they call themselves a Christian and maybe they've accepted the Lord, but still like on Sunday they're a Christian, but on Friday night they're not a Christian or on, you know, at home they're uh, not a Christian, but at school they are a Christian. Like it's sort of this idea of just like these two conflicting um, things in your life living simultaneously and sort of fighting, um, fighting for you. And I think about it like lukewarm, you get lukewarm because you mix hot and cold. But in the process, it becomes neither hot or cold. And so it's sort of like a lose-lose situation. And why Jesus says, I would rather you be hot or cold, because then at least you can go from one to the other. But if you're lukewarm, you're neither of those things. Um, and uh, I don't know, like this is the one that scares me the most, because how many Christians are out there that really do like have salvation and really do like want to walk in the Lord, but are just stuck also living a very worldly lifestyle and are also um, like, they're not fully in, you know what I mean? Like maybe they go to church, but they're not plugged in on ministry and they're still struggling with a lot of sins. And um, I don't know, that's just a hard one. Like if they can't address the things that are going on in their heart, then you're just living two different lives. Yeah. Yeah, the Bible talks about, um, it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Huh. And um, I, th- I I wouldn't say I, I struggle with being lukewarm, but I think I definitely struggle with, with that. Like, you know, like a yes being yes and like a no being no. I think it's easy to like walk a line of, of like not making decisions and of like not committing to something or, you know, confronting what's like what's evil, what's not good. Uh, and it's kind of like along the same lines of like being lukewarm. Like it's neither like hot or cold, neither like a yes or no, just right in like the middle. And, um, I think it's interesting how like, like God said, he'd rather you be, be cold, rather be, rather you be so far one way yeah. than, than like, you know, foot on each side. Um, yeah, I think it's a good one. I think it's interesting how, um, how easy that is to fall into that. Yeah. And just to be clear, I'd struggled with that. And I relate to it because that's how I was before I was a Christian. Corey, before we hit but, record, don't come on. Just <laughs> no, but um, Matthew six twenty four says, "No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other." And then, like we were talking about earlier, the the hard reality of being a lukewarm Christian is that one of the two sides is going to win in the end, and it's much easier for the sinful worldly side to win. Like you're, if you don't do anything, if you just kind of default to nothing, you will abandon your faith. You will Mm -hmm. lose your faith. Sin will overcome you. The world and desires will overcome you. And that's the hard part for me is like, if you're not, if you're not being real with God and you're just allowing yourself to live a double life, essentially you're kind of already sealing your grave. Like you're already deciding which side you want to be on. You're just kind of putting it off. Um, by by living both or trying to do both at the same time. The third one is a backslidden Christian. Um, and that's someone who has received the faith, but now because they're unbelief or some, some tragic event or maybe something that's happened to them, um, they've abandoned it for some reason. And I don't want to touch on this, this one a ton. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, but I do want to talk about like, what do you do with unbelief? Like, what do you do when you are struggling with your faith? Um, and if we go back to, to the guy in Mark, um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things was one that he, he acted in spite of his doubts. So again, this guy probably had a really gnarly life and had a lot of gnarly circumstances with his son. I don't know where he came from, how long he had to travel, what it took to even find Jesus. But even though he wasn't sure, like even though he wasn't exactly confident that God was even going to be able to do anything for him, he still went out and tried. Mm -hmm. I think that's super important. Like 
I know, I know for me and even now sometimes thinking about how like, well, like I, I could do this. I could go talk to this person. I could like admit this thing, but like, is it really going to like help or like, mm-hmm. is it really going to change anything? And I think it's important to know like, yes, you should always default. You should always try to do something like never not do anything. You know what I mean? Um, the, the second one is that he asked for help, right? Even when Jesus called him out on his unbelief and said, um, you know, like essentially, uh, you know, who do you think that you're talking to? Um, he still, uh, the guy in Mark still asked Jesus for help. He said, help me with my unbelief. I think that's such a cool, like attitude mm-hmm. just to have in your faith is God help me with the things that I'm struggling with about you. Help me with the things that I don't understand. Help me with the things, um, that are making me like tempted to fall away from you because you're, you're positioning yourself in, um, in a state of receiving in a, in a state of surrender instead of just opting for nothing and, uh, and just kind of like ignoring it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, um, I've like worked with guys in the past and we're doing something and uh, like for, for my business and they've said, like since they've started, they've said, Hey, like, you know, if I'm doing something wrong, like if I'm, you know, being too slow or too sloppy, or whatever, like let me know so I can do better. Mm. And I've worked with other guys that, so anyway, the first person, you know, they may work a little slower. They may, um, you know, might not be as strong or whatever. And I have other guys who are like just burly beasts and like, you know, they work really hard, but they don't like, they don't ask for instruction and they don't really listen. And it's kind of like, man, I, I'd, I'd rather have someone that's going to ask me and like want to learn and want mm. to like see like you know someone who's going to acknowledge an issue like and want to fix it and want to do better kind of like this first saying like yeah hey, lord help me with my unbelief like it, it it's here like i know it's here like help me work through it um i think that's a better attitude and better mindset than um like being someone or something that that we um either afraid to ask for help or we're convinced we don't need help like we we know what we're doing um yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and the third one is that he admitted his unbelief yeah. and that's kind of like the the it can be the final or it can be the first step in this whole process of just addressing your unbelief. But I still think it's so important to call out, like you have to admit it and especially you have to admit it to God. And again, going back to that question of just asking, like tell God the things that you're struggling with. And I always like to say, um, cause I feel like I go over this with my, with my small group kids and other ministries that I'm involved in, but like God already knows, like he already knows all the, all of your thoughts, all the things that you struggle with everything that you do, every attitude that you have. Um, Psalm 139, four says, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Like God knows what you're thinking before you even think it. So what's the use in trying to hide it, right? We should position ourselves again in surrender and in receiving and telling God, God, these are the things that I'm thinking about. Like, you know what? Here's how it is. I don't understand this. I'm struggling with that. I don't get this and I don't like this, but at least you're saying it, at least you're admitting it. Um, and there's so many times in the Bible, I feel like this is, this can be kind of related to, um, to confession. Like it's, it's almost a confession, uh, not of sin, but a confession of a lack of faith. And God loves confession. You know, he says, confess and repent and your sins will be forgiven of you. You'll have eternal life. So it's along those same lines of just like, why try to pretend just admit it like just face it and say it good good all right I made the record to show it. that i was paying attention i was just i was reading your <laughs> i was reading your notes Corey, um he spoke today at the travel and he when he like writes a message or anything he like writes his thoughts out and it's like sentences he literally writes out what he's gonna say like every single word yeah and it's i think it's interesting so i was like reading his <laughs> reading because he only like just now that was like 10 percent of what he wrote yeah so i was reading it all sorry anyway i got caught no worries um any more thoughts you wanted to say to um about? no I, I think i'll just touch on one more time like i think it'd be really easy to try to put up this kind of front especially for other people that like everything's fine everything's good i don't struggle with anything my faith is good and in reality that that might not be what's happening. That might not be how things are. And in the same way, why should we treat God the same way? Like God knows everything. Don't try to put up a front with God. Like be real with God. 
Yeah, I, I want to say like um, if if you don't uh, acknowledge it or bring it up, like it doesn't it doesn't change the circumstance. Like it's still yeah. gonna continue. So if something good is going on, like the, the good's gonna continue. But if it's bad, like that bad. It's, it's going to keep coming. It's like you said, like with the water analogy, like the wa- water is going to fill off the space in the room. It's, it's going to find like the low points. It's what it, water does. Um, like you can't stop it. And so, yeah, I mean, same thing. Like you, you're, you need to acknowledge it and you need to talk about it. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, well, we can wrap it up, but that's it. Yeah. Actually, one more thing <clears throat> I was thinking about was if there is something in your life that is causing you to question your faith, to have doubt, to even just like put your faith kind of on hold, talk to someone about it mm-hmm. and tell them what's going on because you're not alone. I, I feel like so easily it's like, well, I'm the only one that's experiencing this thing. And in reality, like five or six other people in the same room with you probably have gone through the same thing and they can speak to it and help you and encourage you with it. Um, but also if you have like a really deep intellectual question, there are really smart people out there that can answer it for you and mm-hmm. who would love to answer it for you. It's like, why should you just not try to go get it answered? As- always been funny to me there's been so many times when um like at like a camp or like a small group where like a kid's come yeah. up to me and said like oh man like i have to confess this to you and they're like bawling they're <laughs> so like in the moment and caught up and i was like oh like cool like you're the third one tonight that told me you know it's just like <laughs> it's it's funny because like you're saying it's a good point that we often convince ourselves we're the only one with like those questions or doubts or sins and it's like dude like everyone goes through this stuff so i'm glad you said that yeah cool all right you want to take us away i guess so <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. If you like what you heard, please leave us a five star review. And if six you, stars. If you're feeling generous, give us six okay. stars. Right. I guess you can leave five stars and then write in an emoji, right? The star emoji. Yep, use the star emoji. Yeah, that's, that's the way to the do sixth. it. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at cultivateandkeep.com or you can reach out on Facebook or Instagram. And besides that, we'll see you next time. Later.